distinguished guests, dear 2017 Mandela Washington Fellows, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I hope you enjoy your lunch. Welcome to this panel discussion that deals with US and African perspectives on leadership. My name is Leon Gamay. I am from Benin Republic. I, Benin is a, a lovely and beautiful country that celebrated its 57th independence anniversary yesterday. We are proud of that. I am journalist and communication media consultant. I've been spending the past six weeks in Indiana, in Indiana, in Indiana University of Bloomington with 24 other prominent and talented young African leaders. I like it. I'm privileged to be the moderator of this panel discussion. Let me now introduce to you our distinguished panelists, starting from Dr. Helen Gale, expert on global development, humanitarian and health issues. Dr. Helen Gill is CEO of McKinsey Social Initiative, a nonprofit organization that implements programs that bring together various stakeholders to address global challenges. McKinsey Social Initiative first program called Generation addresses the problems of youth employment with programs in five countries. I mean India, Kenya, Mexico, Spain, and the United States. The goal is to connect one million young people with skills to jobs in five years. But before a current position, Dr. Gale was president and CEO of KUSA, K International, uh, a leading international humanitarian organization with approximately 10,000 staff. K poverty fighting programs reach over 97 million people in 87 countries, including African countries. Dr. Gay serves as on many public companies and nonprofit boards. Named on Forbes 100 Most Powerful Women, Foreign Policy Magazine <laughs> Top 100 Global Thinkers, and Newsweek's Top 10 Women in Leadership she has been honored with award from Columbia University, Banner College, the US Public Health, among others. Thank you, Dede for joining us. <laughs> Our second guest is Mr. Norman Moyo. Uh, Mr. Norman Moyo is a Pan-African business executive with over 15 years in telecoms, technology, banking, and FMCG sector across seven markets. Mr. Moyo is currently a group executive at Econet, which is a, an African telecoms media and technology company. Within his role, his responsibility include being CEO of Kumi International, an internet of thing company. But previously, Mr. Moyo was CEO of Helios Tower Tanzania and Etisala Tanzania. In, 2000 and in 2011, as a result of his work in Nigeria, Mr. Moyo was awarded the prestigious Global Telecom Business Top 40 Telecoms Leadership Awards. He was under 40 then. In 2015, he wrote a book entitled Rambo in the Jungle, Leadership from an African Perspective. The book was described by Jamie Anderson of London Business School as a must read for leaders who are seeking meaningful insights into doing business in Africa. Thank you for being in our sir. Uh, during the coming 60 minutes, we will we'll elaborate the title of this panel by hearing our guest, Vision of Leadership based on their personal life the professional experience, and the national context. You, I mean Mandela Washington Fellows, you have the opportunity to take part in this discussion through your questions or contributions. I would like to, to give the kickoff by giving the floor to Mr. Moyo. 
So your book is entitled Rambo in the Jungle, Leadership from an African Perspective. Can you explain to the fellow what you mean by African perspective? What is it and how does it apply to leadership? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the fellows for the invitation. I actually told my wife that, uh, can you imagine in your wildest dreams, I've been invited to the Mandela Washington Summit? And she responded, oh, sweetie, you are not in never in my wildest dreams. But congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations indeed. So thank you. It, it, it's wonderful to be here. It's also very wonderful to see uh, for, for someone who considers himself Pan-African, this is probably the ultimate uh, event for me to, to attend. And more so because I think, as you said, in 2014, I published a book which I had been writ writing for 10 years on how can we, how can we as Africans impact the continent. Uh, what do we do to this? We like to call it a preserved continent, not necessarily a dark continent. It's just preserved. But how can we impact it in a positive way? And one of the things I found out in my corporate career life is I realized that uh, it actually just takes a few good individuals in, in leadership positions to transform an organization. Uh, and I've seen it. I've, I've done it myself when I was in Zambia. Uh, worked with a team, and we created history in that business. I also see the similar situation when I was in Nigeria. Then I realized, OK, so if a few individuals in an organization can cause such an impact, certainly such few individuals can also cause an impact at a national level, at a leadership level. So I then decided to package a number of my learnings over the years at the corporate level and try to apply it at a national level. So one of the biggest challenges in the continent today is leadership. And I'm excited to see the people here because they, create, they present that catalyst to provide that transformation for the continent. So that's why the book came about as there is a jungle there. And there's something nice about a jungle. It's full of fruits, full of gold, full of oil. But we need to go in there and mine that wealth that the continent has. And leadership is the key to be able to unlock that potential. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gale, how do you think that American leadership differs from African leadership, or, or does it differ, really? Yeah, um, and I, I would also just like to, to start out, I don't have a joke quite as good as yours, but... Because uh, um, your husband is Because my husband is here, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but, um, you know, it, it really is wonderful to be here and to look out. We've got this bright light in our eyes, so we can't see the audience fully. But uh, to be able to look out and see this incredible network of young African leaders and knowing that this experience has given you both skills but also another network. And, you know, maybe in some ways, um, networks is one of the real big issues in the whole leadership uh, and, I, I, and, and I wouldn't say necessarily that there's a huge distinction but I, I, I do think when you think about what the United States has always had um, networks as one of those. The fact that you know we are the richest nation in the world and ha you know have incredible wealth, um, incredible education institutions, et cetera, et cetera. It does mean that by accident of birth, one may have access to some things that include the networks that are part of the United States that sometimes give people an advantage. That said, these, that's why I think programs like this are so, so important, because I think it is by opening up networks, um, yes, it's getting the skills that we all get when we go through our training experiences, uh, but I do think that power of networks is something that doesn't get as exploited as possible, because once one has a network of people who are able to open up opportunities and to say, you know, because I believe in this person, I will help them um, get a leg up and get an opportunity. And so, you know, I think that, that, whole, that whole aspect of how do we make sure that we're opening our network Works is, is, you know, I think not necessarily a distinction, but I think historically, you know, we have here in this country have had the access that I hope we're starting to, to open up and have opportunities like this. You know, I just feel, um, as, uh, you know, Mr. Boyle was saying, that having, thinking deliberately about leadership 
is something that I think some of us, and I, you know, I'll say for myself, I think I came to it later than I should have. I kind of became a, an accidental leader because of a lot of the roles that I play. But I think having the opportunity to step back and think about leadership, think about what your leadership style is, what are the things that you feel you do well, what are the things that as a leader you feel you need to strengthen, and being very deliberate about that. Because I, you know, I think sometimes we come into our roles and our positions without understanding the full potential of what we have and what we we are able to contribute. And as, again, as I look out and see this incredible uh, audience, you know, this is the future of where Africa will go and where the future future of Africa, I think, in many ways, is the future of where the world is going to go. Thank you. Uh, let me now go back to Mr. Moyu. In your in your book, you infer that you are convinced that finding the right leaders in communities, societies, companies, and countries is the fundamental difference between prosperity and poverty. Why do you think leadership is so critical to solving the issue of poverty that plagues in Africa? Yeah, I, I think that came from, um, I said, if my father, and my father doesn't have a million dollar company, but if my father had a million dollar company, and I and don't take offense to any of the finance ministers out there in Africa, I would love to be able to interview as a finance minister and be able to take you on as a finance manager for my father's company. Unfortunately, in the continent today, we have a lot of lawyers freestyling as finance ministers. Now, I don't have a problem with a lawyer. If I've got a court case, I love a lawyer to represent me. But it's a very different story to take a lawyer and put him into a minister of finance and expect him to manage things like supply money, supply, interest rates, the global economy, it's way too complicated. So what has happened in the continent today is we've got a lot of people are not being given roles on the basis of merit. And that I was discussing outside that, you know, if I want to be a politician in Africa, you know what I do? I was still in my current company today, get fired. In fact, that's not good enough. Put me in the newspaper, embarrass me, then I'll run for politics. Now, <laughs> Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I have had a number, because I've worked in a lot of African countries, and I've seen some of these things happening. But you also have got case studies like Singapore, even our own Rwanda, where you've got in Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, put together one of the finest team as ministers. You know where he got them from? He actually went into the private sector and picked people like doctor here and says, I'm going to give you a minister of health to run. I'm going to miss, give you a minister of uh, development to run. She has run businesses very efficiently and very proficiently. Trust me, she knows how to run things. So she will not stumble so much. And that's how Singapore ended up moving from a third world to a first world in one generation. They had a bunch of CEOs running the show. And you know what, they paid them the same way they would pay a normal CEO. You see, most of our ministers would pay them peanuts. And no wonder why they start trying to cultivate and make a deal on the side. You want, you want, what, you want, if you pay peanuts, you attract what? Uh, thank you, I thought I was talking to myself. Thank you. <laughs> so by, by so saying, uh, are, you, are you calling on, I mean, businessmen to engage in politics? Thank you. So that, the, the, the real source of my frustration as a Pan-African today is to say, what is our generation doing? How are we contributing to the welfare of the continent? Now, you can take the Nelson Mandela's of this world, the Nyerere's, even the Mugabe's in their own way, they have actually done a tremendous job in fighting an issue, a cause with great success. Then it was colonialism. Our generation, which is well-educated, well-exposed, we actually run big companies. When I was in Nigeria, I was looking after a $2 billion business. We have got the experience and the training to be able to get into government and work and help some of these governments to work. Unfortunately, your guys who are actually well-merited do not want to be found in politics in Africa. The, the only problem is your company, that very viable company you are so proud of, the guy who is going to be legislating around that company is your security guard, who has got no idea what you're talking about, but he's in parliament. And he's your minister if you're not careful. So, and this is the reality of the continent now. Uh, 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 let me come back to Dr. Gill. Uh, Dr. Gill, the, the general narrative is that youth can only find success in business or entrepreneurships. 
What's your message to civic leaders or youth engaged in public, in public management? Yeah, and I, I'll just kind of um, take off from where you left off. I mean, I, I do think that professionalizing government is important. I think that that may be a distinction between all business people going into government because I, you know, I, I do think that there is clearly a value in having, you know, the three sectors, if you will, you know, having the private sector, having the public sector, and having the social sector and civil society, and I think they, the three work together in tandem. And so, you know, I think as as you very well articulated, having a much more professional uh, approach to government. And that includes having more business-like uh, techniques and having people who are actually qualified for their jobs. So having a finance minister who knows something about finance, a health minister who knows something about health, et cetera. Um, but it also means that there, you know, there are two other sectors in which people can, um, besides public, private sector and entrepreneurship, and you're right, there's a lot of focus on developing businesses and everybody can go out and start their business. And by the way, that's the same thing here in this country. We have you know, the same kind of millennial generation. Everybody is gonna start their own uh, business or their own NGO. And I think there's a lot to be said for entrepreneurship, but there's also a lot to be said for um, the social sector and having people who say, you know, I want to be part of civil society and part of the voice that keeps our governments accountable um, and is able to do, to focus more on how are we making sure that the community needs and social needs are being met. So I just think it's a dance between all three. You know, so people talk about the golden triangle or uh, the triple bottom line or, you know, there are lots of ways of thinking about how do these sectors come together in ways that create create value, economic value, and social value, but everybody appreciating their different roles. So I, you know, I, I encourage young people to think beyond only business entrepreneurship, but thinking about how can you be a social entrepreneur or a public sector entrepreneur. It's the mindset of entrepreneurship that I think can go into any of the sectors that make a difference in building a stable and um, economically viable society. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Moyo, we, we, we all know that it's, it is not easy to, to be a businessman and a successful businessman in Africa with those issue of, of corruption and bribery and everything. How did you succeed in going through all this and reaching the stage you are today? Um, I think one of the, my, the highlight of my career, uh, obviously, is a lot of people ask me, I've worked in seven countries, which one is your favorite? It was actually Nigeria. I, I enjoyed so much. Um, if my ogas are here, if my ogas are here, I'm also one of the ogas there. But uh, I love the pepper soup. I love everything about the country. I love, the, I love the, uh, also 1015, the big one. Yeah. But when I moved from Zambia to Nigeria, one of the questions was, how are you going to survive in Nigeria? Firstly, I was very young. Uh, I was in an executive team. I was 31 or so. I think the, low, the youngest, next youngest was 46. So that was also the first issue I had to deal with. But secondly, I was running a $100 million budget because it was a marketing budget that I was running. I was chief marketing officer there. And when you run a $100 million budget, budget you have got lots of friends that come your way. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, and they came in great style. Some came bringing in friends, bringing in relatives, and they wanted to play golf with me, but there was a lot going on. But I think in the first chapter of my book, I talk about values. Leadership in Africa, if you want to be a successful leader, you need to be very clear as an individual what are your values. And those values, <laughs> thank you, those values need to be well articulated. So I've got five values. Everyone who has ever worked for me in Africa, and there's a lot. They know if you bump into them, they'll tell you my five values. Legacy. I'd like you to visit my funeral one day. I want to hear what you say at the funeral. Uh, integrity is my second value. I like to sleep well at night. I don't like to lose sleep over what did I sign? Was there anything hanky-panky that went with it? That value is a non-negotiable. Everyone who has ever worked for me understands that. Lifelong learning, work, and profit. But the second value in particular became is sacrosanct. No lines are supposed to be crossed. So what happened is, when I told my immediate staff, they told their friends and they told their suppliers. I think one guy walked into my office six months and says, oh, we heard about you, Oga. You don't chop all. 
meaning you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't chop also. These days we don't pay anyone anything because the big ogre doesn't chop. And that's how these things work. Mm -hmm. Now, if I can be trusted with a smaller budget of $100 million, certainly if you give me a billion dollars, I'll probably behave the same way. So I think understanding that value system is key and also communicating it. But you see, the fish always rots from the top. In Africa, we have seen the fish rotting from the top. And then when you look at the entire body, it's contaminated. And that's what's happening across the continent in a number of countries. And that's why we need to almost weed out this whole, it's almost a cancer eating the system. But it starts with the leadership. And that's why for me, leadership is a non-negotiable. And getting the right people is something that everyone in this room, and in the last chapter of the book, I've had to put, I've created a platform on how everyone in this room is going to contribute into, to their own country's transition from where we are today to the future that our children will be happy with. But the way things are going right now, we might all be exporting our children everywhere. And they might also be chased if they, are, they come to certain places. So it's important we fix our own homeland. So that's how we want to address the issue of corruption in Africa is simply putting in the right people. I'm not saying corporate people and uh, your, your natural leaders don't steal. There was a certain analogy. You know, they normally take 10%, they leave 90% in the, in, the, in the country. Unfortunately, some of our politicians today take 90% and leave 10%. You can't go very far in that route. So it's probably you can never eliminate it, but you can certainly get to a certain level of efficiencies that are good for the nation. Thank from you. where we are today. We'll now open the discussion to our, our fellows with their questions and, and contribution. So if you raise your hand, you, can you help? No. Yeah, let, let us start with the, the lady in the, in the front. Can we have the microphone? So you introduce yourself by giving your, your name, of course, your track and your, your institute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Stella Satarukai from Zambia. I was at the University of Notre Dame under the business and entrepreneurship track. Go Irish! <laughs> <laughs> My question is um, on young, brilliant people joining politics. One of the things that stops us is the fact that the system is already rotten. So we believe that if you join politics, uh, your reputation might go down because everyone might think that you are similar to the politicians. And I was having uh, discussions with several fellows who want to join politics, but this is affecting them, whether they're from Z Zambia, Zimbabwe, Ghana. So what would your advice be on people that want to join politics? We believe that we are brilliant. We believe that we might effect change, but the system is not conducive for our reputation at the moment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so yes. Okay, thank you. Um, that's a something very close to my heart. I said earlier on, insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So if you join politics in Zambia today, or in Zimbabwe, or in South Africa, or even in Kenya, any of the parties that you have, and I know them, you're probably just going to be more of the same. Now, in the last chapter of the book, and I had to have to sell this to you, I said I've been battling with that particular question. How do I participate without being part of uh, ZANU-PF or ANC or this movement? I felt the platforms that exist today in Africa are non-conducive. In fact, if we all just join political parties today, we're probably going to be worse off in 50 years. But technology is now allowing us to do things differently. So Uber is in, in, in Africa today. Uber is, as you know, is a platform. They don't own a single car. Why do you have to join a, politi politi a political party to be relevant in your country? So I said, maybe let's form an alternative. <laughs> now, let me just a little bit zoom in. What is that alternative? So I don't want us to be seen to be a think tank, because part of the book is about leadership, strategy, execution, and output. So I'd hate to be a think tank. So I put in a platform called Ajib Zambia. Any government in power, Ajib Zambia. So I want to launch that in Zambia, and you will be uh, uh, member number one. Now, what do I want you to do? I would like you 
In that Ajib Zambia, we're going to have two million Zambians in that grouping. It's a platform. We will work with the government in power. We will provide the government in power with good permanent secretaries, good, but we will also hold them accountable. We're going to ask the president, Mr. President, congratulations for your nomination. We know you're fighting with your opposition, but Mr. President, instead, can you tell us what are your five key objectives? He's going to tell us on camera. No, 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 put it this way, Mr. President. Okay, now you're perfect. Let me take that message, Mr. President, and let me try to sell it to the entire nation. This is Ajib, a self-funded platform movement that is whose sole existence is to make sure that the government is functional. Because if that government fails, your children are going to suffer significantly. So you need to find a platform where both the opposition and anyone can actually join. But we don't talk politics, we talk governance. Because that's, what, that's all you're interested in, isn't it? It's not necessarily the power. Yeah, and I, just, to, just to add to that, you know, I think I would 100% endorse that. And, you know, when I was working at CARE, a lot of the work that we did was really looking at how, how do you work with citizens to hold governments accountable. And I think technology has really provided, as you said, a real enabler. But, I, you know, when I look back even in our own history, and whether it was the civil rights movement or the women's movement or, you know, a whole range of things, or today, you know, Black Lives Matter, Matter, et cetera. You know, it is because citizens get uh, make their voices heard, and then are able to put gov governments make governments accountable. And I, I think sometimes we underestimate the power of civil society and what you can do to really help make governments accountable. And then once you have governments that have changed, then it's time to go in and be part of the government. But you want to, as you said, to be part of a government that's not going to pull you down and and pull you to the least common denominator denominator, but to actually be part of a government that's moving its citizens forward, that has its, the interest of its uh, country people in best mind. So you've got to do that work beforehand. And then once the governments have become accountable, that's the time for you to run and be the president of Zambia. <laughs> yes? Thank you. Uh, my name is Kanono Tavane from the Mountain Kingdom of Lesotho. I have been uh, placed uh, at the Kansas State University. I just have two questions for the panelists. Uh, the first question is uh, one of uh, the values which I cherish a lot is empathy. And I wanted to hear the positions of our panel in terms of how do they see empathy in a business context and also in a, in a, in a civil society concept as a value which is very strong and keen to, to, to leadership. The second question that I would like to ask relates to the fact that I think that much of the discussion that we've been hearing talks about leadership in a corporate environment and which is an environment with authority whereby you get to exercise the authority over others to see your vision, to see your values. How do we practice leadership in a civic context whereby there's no authority? How do you get people in a village uh, to mobilize them and rally them behind your cause in a context whereby there's no authority, they are not entitled to follow you, and quite frankly, they are thinking, which political party do you support? So how do we practice leadership in a context where there's no authority? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gill? Yeah. Um, I guess the first one was on empathy. And I, you know, I think that, that empathy is an incredibly powerful um, value and an incredibly powerful action. I think the ability, you know, empathy, if you say broadly speaking, is the ability to understand another person and kind of walk in their shoes. You know, I think that that is something that more and more people are talking about as an important role in leadership. Uh, and I think it, it does link to your second question because I think oftentimes in, um, you know, in civil society or in the non-business context where, as you said, 
businesses have tended to be more hierarchical leadership. I think that's changing a lot, but that has been more traditional. You have um, the profit motive, you have actual uh, financial incentives that can be used that, that in some ways you know, has, has allowed for a different kind of leadership model, but you may talk about that more. I think, that's, you know, I think that is, that is uh, continuing to change. But I think this role of empathy plays a large part in um, leadership broadly. And I think people are willing to follow leaders who they feel are actually there to serve their interest. And I think being empathetic is one of those qualities that allow people to feel like you're actually there not for your own purpose, but you're there because you actually believe that you have skills that can help to serve others. And I often think about the servant leadership model, which is talked about a lot, particularly in the, in the social sector, where, where people are attracted to your leadership because you see your role as helping to enable others versus helping to empower yourself. So I think that, you know, that, that has always been the way that I've tried to think about leadership is, you know, what is it that the organization needs from me? What is it that the community needs from me? How do you actually get people to buy in into a vision that you create together. And I think creating a shared vision is also very much a part of that. And then how do you make people feel like they're part of the solution and connect them to uh, where, you know, where you want to go? So uh, you know, I think that's the type of leadership model that I think works a lot more um, when you don't have a hierarchical command and control structure. I'll just add that uh, I think Three, sometimes there are three quadrants that um, matter, whether it's in a community environment, it's in a small business, you're running your own bakery. I saw a lady from Botswana, she probably, I'll come to your bakery actually, get some bread when I get to Gaberon. Whether you're running a corporation, what are your people, your stakeholders, your community members most passionate about? You've got to find that. Whatever business you run, uh, they call it the hedgehog concept. What are your people most passionate about? Because if you connect with them at that level, they'll follow you. The second question you ask is, what is the one thing that you can offer or do as a community, as a business, as a bakery, that you can do better than anyone else? If you run a bakery in Botswana, what makes your bakery the most unique in the world? Don't even compete with just Botswana only, in the entire world. Mm -hmm. Because hey, today the Chinese can actually bring bread into Africa, and you might have unfair competition. So you've got to have that recipe that says, this, is, this makes this bakery the most unique in the world. The last one is, what is that economic driver? That's one thing that you can do that will generate the numbers for you. If it's a community environment, what is that that the community wants to see? What, 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 so what is going to stroke your numbers continuously in the right direction? Now, what is going to be the, that service delivery that the community will be proud of? When you put all these three things together, you will get a following. You actually don't need a lot of uh, uh, stripes for people to follow. Uh, people follow a passionate leader who speaks to their needs, who follows through on their execution requirements. So it, it's the, the rules are basically the same whether you're running a billion dollar company or you're running a community service. You've got to be able to align your objectives with your community. Yes, another question. Yes, let's go to the, to the left. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Chipapa Ogri from Zambia, uh, San Diego University Business and Entrepreneurship Track. Yes, uh, Mr. Moyo, I admire your, your lifestyle. You've told me that you went to Mount Billion companies, well as Bill Nyang. But there's this trend in the communities where they say with uh, gray hair goes knowledge, and with young people and technology goes some um, dubious means. And um, my concern here is most of us here are young and are people that have more to do with technology. And the community are thinking maybe with the te technology that we are coming in, we are bringing issues that will you know, not bring development whatsoever. But again, I've seen aged sitting in offices, policies being changed where retirement age is extended, leaving a number of young people out of employment. Now, I want you to, to please help me 
see how we can survive on that one and how we can marry the two, or how we can work hand in hand with the knowledge uh, of, of great hair and also the technology of young people so that we can sit in those offices and be able to serve our communities. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think you mentioned technology. Um, Africa today boasts of probably one of the most advanced technological uh, revolutions in the world. Uh, if you look at um, your, if you Zambia, Airtel Money, M-Pesa, um, MTN Money out of Nigeria, uh, Safaricom itself has become a centerpiece of how to do financial inclusion in Africa. That's what technology is able to do. Uh, let me also, part of my day job, I've got a night job, by the way. If I had more time, I'll tell you about the night job. But it's actually driven by technology, and it's very entrepreneurial. So during the day, I work a day job, and I've got a boss. Uh, I have to align every now and then. And at night, I'm actually a boss of myself, and I run my own night business. But all of those businesses are technology driven. So the young generation are probably best placed than even the older generation, because you guys are very savvy with technology. You understand it. I gave you an example of Uber. That is very far-fetched, probably very high level. But today, we are running a platform in Africa called Tech Night. And we have got 10,000 installers, highly skilled installers across the continent today. So if you are Peter and you are an electrician today, qualified one, with the proper papers, of course, we are actually putting you onto our platform today, just like Uber. So if you are in Kablonga, it's a, it's a suburb in, Zam in Zambia, if you're in Kablonga, you can actually go to your tech night app, the same way you do Uber, and you say, I'm looking for a, a highly skilled installer to come to my house and do a fiber to home. And Peter's name will show up, and Peter, you can be guaranteed, Peter has been vetted by ourselves, and he is, is indeed an electrician, not a plumber freestyling as an electrician. <laughs> Because some of us, we've lived in all of Africa, we've had those plumbers come to fix electricity issues. And there were problems, as you can imagine. But what that platform does, it today, Peter would have been just only waiting for one call to fix an electricity problem. But we have now added an additional skill set to the same Peter to be able to do fiber to home. The next biggest gold in oil in Africa is actually fiber, or data, as you put it. But I'm now enabling Peter to be able to use my platform to be able to actually add to his skill set. So Peter can do electricity now. He can also do fiber to home installation. I've just added Kwese. And by the way, we've got uh, Kwese is a Pan-African media company that uh, we have in our portfolio. And we've brought another 100 decoders to some of you guys here. I'm not sure how we're going to give away them away, but we'll figure out how to do it. But the same Peter is able to install Kwese which is a satellite television installation. And I've just added solar. The same Peter now is able to do solar. Now, remember what Peter was doing yesterday. He was waiting at the bus stop, waiting for a call to fix an electricity, which is not very regular. Now I've got five services that Peter can do, and I'm paying him handsomely for each of these services. Not only me, Samsung is coming to me and they're saying, Norman, we would like to use your platform Tech Night so that Peter can also do deployments for our Samsung products. Now, can you imagine what has just happened because of technology and because of the African youth who is very versatile with the use of technology? So age is not an issue. Probably some of us wish we were a little bit younger because the opportunities are a lot in the continent. So if I answer your, to answer your question, technology has become the biggest enabler. In fact, we used to say for every 10% improvement in teledensity, that is your mobile penetration, there is a 1% improvement in development. I think that number is going to even exponentially grow with the improvement in data connectivity in the continent. And the biggest crowd that will benefit is almost everyone, or most of you sitting in here, except, of course, the ones that are older, like myself. <laughs> Dr. Gage, do you want to have something? Yeah. OK. Another question? Let me. Uh, let us let us go to where, to come to where, or go to West Africa because we've been yes, in West, West Africa, Africa so far. Uh, yeah, right in front of you there. Yes, I can see the uh, regalia. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Mizuchuku Michael. Uh, I'm from Nigeria. I was uh, trained at Georgia State uh, Public Management. 
quickly, I, I, I lead a, a network of young, dedicated, restless civil servants in Nigeria working to raise the bar for accountability, for professionalism and ethics in public sector institutions. So I just quickly wanted to let you know what I do because it's very important from the point of view that I know, Mr. Moyo, you have a lot of experience working with uh, public servants in your work, probably also ma'am. Uh, so I would like to hear your perspective from the outside. How can we, especially those of us in public sectors, how can we uh, uh, strategically uh, bring about change from the inside, from your experience working from the outside? How can we, inside the system, what approaches can we really employ to uh, 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 strengthen our very weak uh, public sector institutions? I'm very, I'm very confident that your perspectives will be very important and will help us in our work, especially those of us in public management that are working with government in this place. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's a great, great question. Um, and I, uh, just to put context also, spent 20 years in um, our government system. I was with our U.S. Public Health Service, the Centers for Disease Control, and um, you know worked uh, with our Agency for International Development. So I've worked in, in our U.S. public health, uh, our U.S. public sector system um, for a long time, and interfaced a lot with with go with government and public sectors in Africa in the context of that work. So you know just to say, you know, I think, um, and I think we, we've all said it in different ways, professionalizing the public sector is so important. And so I think it's setting the bar high, setting, the, setting clear standards for, um, you know, who enters public service, for example. You know, are there, uh, in our public service, we have certain uh, tests that people have to take to show that they actually have a certain level of proficiency. So, you know, having, having the standards, uh, making sure that, you know, there, is, there are clear performance metrics and all the other things that professionalize the public sector. But I also think it means um, changing salary levels because we know that oftentimes public servants are not well, well paid, therefore they have to seek um, compensation in other ways, including you know, being prey to, to corruption uh, or um, taking on two or three other jobs in order to be able to support families. So I think we also have to think about what are the compensation levels and how, how does that actually sink to the uh, professional standards. And you know, I just think holding account the accountability is so important, the professionalization, having clear guidance on you know, what are the standards, what are the requirements, so that anybody isn't just there. And then I think starting to shift people's opinion of what public sector is, because I think in many countries it still has a very low um, status to go into at least the career, and I think you're talking about career public servants as opposed to politicians, and I think there really is still not that status, and I think there needs to be all of those things to actually professionalize it and then raise the level of uh, competency. Uh, I would say I, the question you're trying I call it, how do you get an elephant to dance? <laughs> I think that's where the problem is. And I, I, I really sympathize with you, and someday we'll have a pepper soup and sit and go deeper into it. The problem you have is you've got this monster called a government. And actually, government have to be bureaucratic by their nature. Right? So you have to actually be part of that bureaucracy. I would hate if a government, I talk about Fords and Ferraris in my, in my book, you know, there are certain organizations that are Ferraris, fast, furious, innovative. There are certain organizations that are Fords, slow, sustainable, very consistent. The government is one of those. It has to be a Ford, very slow, whatever. And when you go in there, how do you become creative? How do you become entrepreneurial? How do you become this? Now, there is a way. Unfortunately, you probably, if you try to do it alone, it's difficult. So when you're eating an elephant, as you know, bit by bit, you need to start chopping that money so that you can actually get to where you want to get to with the government. It's not easy as a question, but I believe within your own department, within your own division, there is an opportunity, not intra, I think they call it intrapreneurial 
skill sets you need to start adapting. What can I do for this ministry? I'll tell you, Botswana, for instance, recently started making noises about KPIs. And mm -hmm. we all smiled. But guess what? The country is actually moving. They actually introduced KPIs. Tomorrow you can actually go back to Lagos or Abuja. And they actually says, guys, in here, this is what I got when I went to Washington. Some short man was talking about KPIs. And we need to actually introduce. It's called the SMS, you know, short man syndrome. Uh, you know what that means? <laughs> they talk a lot, so don't worry. For the short ones, <laughs> we're together. But in, Bot in Botswana, they've done it very successfully. You see, unfortunately, for evil to prevail, it takes a good man to do nothing. So you need to be one of those few pockets of lights and do it in your own division. And if you want, make some noise about it. The media is open for everyone. Do it and make a case study for it. And you see, success breeds success. Failure is an orphan. So they will start wanting to do what you did, especially if they read you in the newspapers. Yes, yeah. yes sir. Yes, you will. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry, I was just going to add to, because to, you, you mentioned the success breeds success. And I think, you know, looking at how can you have some quick wins and then have those quickly communicated is, you know, I think your point. And I just think about what Nigeria did with Ebola, for instance. And I think that really helped to galvanize support within the health department because, you know, quickly using the infrastructure that had been developed for some of the other diseases like polio, you know, Nigeria was able to keep e Ebola out of the country. And, you know, I don't think there was ever enough public um, recognition of that, and I'm not even sure how much people within the health department patted themselves on the back for actually having that success. So I think the success breeds success, and telling that story is so, so important. My name is Elma Azuka Damala. I'm from Benin. I'm business and entrepreneurship track in University of Texas. Uh, yesterday, I took part of a panel called um, Story Understanding, Storytelling. So I'm curious to know, both of you, uh, in your career, uh, when you get, like, um, the moment you get in trouble and how you get out of that trouble to inspire me more. That is my question. Say, yeah, say a little bit more about, yeah. Okay, my question is, I would like you to tell us a story oh. about how you, one day you get in trouble and what is that trouble and how you get out of that trouble. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> ladies first. Uh, ladies Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Someone always get to trip you on these events. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Um, uh, I mean, there are lots of troubles that we've gotten into. Uh, I've just gotten into, I'll tell you one which is probably most relevant. Um, when I, I started writing my book eight years ago, um, and when I was due to, to, to release it, I was scared. I was paranoid. I, I actually remember giving it to the former president of Tanzania. Any Tanzanians here? Thank you. Uh, I gave it to uh, President Kappa because he's a former journalist. I didn't want to sign to, to release it eventually because actually because of the sensitivity of the last chapter, it was too punchy. And I gave it to him, he read it, he says, no man, he wrote me a beautiful letter, he says, you, you should have even published during my presidency. But uh, that's not the trouble. And so then I go to the wife and the wife said, no way. I, this." I've got enough problems already without the book. If you add the book and all the talking opportunities in front of a thousand people, no, not interested. The employer was initially very excited, but I knew we're going to fight. So the day I launched it, almost a month later, I went head on with my employer. Why? Because it was taking too much attention. So I got into a lot of trouble. I, luckily, I had done all the right things. I done declarations before I was even employed that I am writing a book. I declared four months before I launched it. It's about to be launched. In the month, this is how I'm going to launch it. But even after I launched it, someone came to me and says, oh, but you had PWC, almost 50 members of PWC bought a copy of your book. Are you sure there is no, because they were our auditors, of course. 
what is going on exactly? I said, how am I supposed to answer that? They bought the book. You want me to deny them to buy the book? So it, it, it got me into trouble. I, I won't tell you about the other troubles. We can discuss outside here. Yeah, um, he's the storyteller. So I, <laughs> um, I, you know, I guess when I think about things that I have done that have gotten in trouble, it's usually being uh, willing to speak more publicly about things than my organization might want me to. And so, you know, I think about a, a lot of my career, I worked on HIV and AIDS. And I worked on HIV and AIDS in the United States and in also a lot in Africa, but, but particularly in the United States at a time when people were not willing to talk about HIV and were not willing to be very straightforward. And I, and I can think of many, many different scenarios where I felt, and I was at that time representing the US government, but where I felt it was important to get out and very publicly talk about some of these issues because people's lives depended on it. And so I took some calculated risk that I um, at times um, was um, called on the carpet for being as outspoken about issues, but always had my facts together and always had, you know, I always led with, if I'm doing this, you know, to embarrass my organization, that's the wrong motivation. But if I'm doing it because I felt that if I did not get out there and talk about these issues, people's lives were in the balance. And so, you know, I think um, when you are getting into trouble for a good reason, then, and for a good motivation, if you have your facts together and you know why you're doing it, oftentimes you're able to get yourself out of that, um, that situation. And there's a, there's a famous politician here in the United States, John Lewis. May, some people may have heard of him. He's a councilman from Georgia. And he was very, very big in the civil rights movement. He was one of the people who got beaten up severely uh, as a result of going out and speaking um, for civil rights. And he always talks about getting in the way and getting in trouble. And you know, he'll always say that if it's good trouble, it's, it's OK. So I think getting into trouble is not a bad thing if you're doing it for a good reason, and particularly if you're doing it for an important cause and it's bigger than yourself. And I'll just add, yeah. I, I hope the, also the question is not coming from fear of failure. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's important, uh, every entrepreneur bo book you read, all the entrepreneurs, I work for Strive Masiwa, whom you know, uh, great entrepreneurs from an African perspective, even globally. And one of the things he will tell you, don't be scared of failure. It, it's perfectly OK. It's the best way to learn. Some say, the, who is the guy who introduced the electricity? He says he found out 1,001 ways of how not to do something. He actually failed. But it's OK. You always have to adopt the cup is half full or half empty. So do not worry about failure. Do not fear. As long as your motives are right, and I think that's what Doc is, as long as your motives are right, you can never be wrong if you're doing the right thing. Yeah, and I'll just say, I, one of the best, uh, I heard somebody one time talk about fail your way to success. Because your failures tend to be your best um, lessons. And when you can learn from failures, that's when you actually succeed. So to your point, I think that that is, in fact, not don't have fear of failure. Get out there, try some things, but learn quickly from those. Yeah. Let, 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 let the lady in the, in the corner, there in the front, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Heather Hanin. I'm from Zambia. And I'm okay. excited. <laughs> I'm excited about Ajib, and I hope that I'll be member number two. Now, um, my question is uh, what is your take on the new concept that I learned? I was at Florida International University um, about having a personal board of directors. Could you attribute that as part of the reason you have succeeded? I would like to know until I have some take home points. Thank you. And when you mean a personal board of directors, you mean like a kitchen cabinet, somebody, a, a board that you, not a formal board of directors. What, what do you mean by a personal board of directors? Um, I mean, um, it could be professional, uh, in, within your workplace, 
or friends or family, yeah, okay. people who okay. can, yeah, um, you understand right. now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and, and I think it, it um, goes along with this notion of the importance of networks. I think having a group of people that may be an informal group of advisors that gives you an outside, somewhat slightly outside perspective, people who you can trust, people who you can actually experiment with ideas without feeling like there will be some consequence. So, you know, a, a, a circle of people who you trust who also have enough expertise in things that you need expertise in, you know, I think can be incredibly important. And so it's a way of building a network, but a network that, that is kind of vested in your success, who's traveling with you, and can be an important part of your uh, leadership journey. I think, it's a, I think it's a great idea, but it, you know, I think the caution is always you know, making sure you have the right people, um, that it's consistent enough, and um, that you, you know, you, it's clear what their role is so that they understand what their responsibility to you is and vice versa. Uh, let me just also add, uh, you know, I talk about horses. In life, you always have to find a good horse to ride on. And typically, those horses come in form of mentor, mentors. And you should have a mentor. Everyone should have a mentor, unless you are one of those suffering from ego. Mm -hmm. where, and we say there's no return on ego in life, nor in business, nor anywhere else. In fact, ever since I worked in Africa, I've always driven a very big car. And the reason why is because I need a car big enough where I can pack my ego when I, before I get into an office. <laughs> because, you know, when you are short, it also comes with its own problems. <laughs> Now, secondly, there is a famous saying in Africa, it says, if you want to go there very fast, go alone. You will probably arrive there very fast. But if you want to go very far, take along with you other people. So every one of you, you need to have a business mentor, a personal mentor, who is an accountability partner that you can have. And then you also build a network around you. But when you look for even partners or mentors, be clear about yourself first. Who are you? I'm a typical Ferrari. Very fast, very furious, creative, but I'm terrible with detail. You send me an email, if you put the, the main message in the board of the email, I won't see it. I just read the headline, and I know it's from Sela, so I assume I know what she wants to talk to me about. I'm a Ferrari. Now, if I'm a Ferrari, I surround myself with Fords. So if you look at my CFO, he is a solid Ford. And he, I would never do anything until it passes through his pen. So as an individual, I surround myself with such. Even if they are mentors, don't look for a mentor who speaks the same language as you. What value is he going to add to you? Don't come to me and try to be creative. I'm creative enough. Come and teach me how to do process. Come and teach you how to put structure. Then you are adding value to my ecosystem. Thank you. Yes, uh, I hope it's not Zambia. Okay. I have a question from Zambia so far. Zambia. <laughs> yes, the, you're talking about that. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful conversation so far. My name is Fardeen, and I um, attended University of Maine. Beautiful, wonderful people. Um, um, I love the point you made earlier on about values. And I would love to uh, pick on your brains a little more on that. I think in Africa, we have a lot of values. I think we have great values. We have great ethics. We have a lot of people wanting to do the right thing. But somehow, those values haven't been systematized well enough. You interact uh, with trust and, and very well with people on individual level. But somehow in government and in business, you don't have systems to, that reflect those values. So I'd love to know what you think about that. Um, I think I could start with, from a values point of view, why there's a disconnect. It is very difficult. Uh, one of the reasons why I make sure that everyone who ever works for me or with me even my peers, you know, my most difficult work as well was my boss. But one day I had to, to be bold enough to tell my boss what my values are. But you set yourself up to be 
pointed at or to be picked at or to be called to order. Now, so it's important that you actually clearly, by the time you fly back to your homes, if you get lucky, the book, oh, sorry, the book is available on Amazon. We've got some copies here, but it's in English and French, by the way, for the love of uh, Francophone uh, Africa. Now, I love Francophone Africa so much, you know, I'm trying to learn French, but I'm having this conversation with my wife over how to learn French, because someone tipped me on how to quickly learn French, but my wife is not agreeing with me. <laughs> we'll get to it someday. So the values, by the time you learned, try to do that exercise. It's an exercise that I thought was most valuable to me. But when you communicate your values to the people around you, even to the world like I have done, trust me, it becomes very difficult for me to falter on them. Now, in organizations, leaders sometimes do not want to commit to these values because it actually puts them on the spotlight. And that refusal to be put on the spotlight means you can always be start to freestyle your way around important things. There are certain values should define who you are. They are your DNA. They should never be subject to questioning or subject to misinterpretation or second guessing. You should know, no man, this line, he does not cross, period. Uh, if you then start to thinking, you know, maybe if you bring in a bag of money or if you bring in a beautiful woman in his office or we throw in some golf balls, he might actually think otherwise, then those values are not solid enough. They need to be watertight, well respected, and there's no second guessing. And they then should reflect, if you're a CEO, it should then reflect in the rest of your organization. Good. Yeah, so no, we are, uh, you. Oh, yeah, I would just, I, first I like the question because I think your point that there are, uh, that traditionally the values are there is, is one just to recognize and I think in many ways to celebrate. Because, you know, um, when looking at it from the perspective of somebody who sits here in, in the United States, what we hear about Africa is always the deficit model. And I think it's important that we recognize how much strength there is in Africa, how traditional values are those core, good, important values. But I think that you know, with a lot of the systems that have been in place, government, corruption, people staying too long in office, et cetera, those values have gotten crowded out. And I think all the things that, you know, that I know you all have learned in your time here and some of the things that you talked about in terms of technology being an enabler, I think the ability to create a platform that gets those values back out there is um, you know, more possible today than ever. And I, you know, I just do believe that there is going to be a turning point uh, as more and more people like yourselves start thinking about how do we make the continent come alive again? How do we make sure that these traditional values are really in the forefront and that people are hearing that about what Africa is? You know, so I just think everybody has a big role in um, sticking to their values, living their values, demonstrating their values, and as a result of that, I think there is a tipping point that, it, that will continue, that, that will come, and those values will be more visible than perhaps they are today. Okay, so we, uh, I'm sorry, we are coming to uh, the end of our panel discussion. I have a, a last question for the panelists. Uh, uh, that will be your, your, your conclusion. So you, this room is filled with young leaders who are talented, have plenty of skills, and what advice do you, do you have for them as they are now embarking on the next step of their leadership journey, starting from Mr. Moyo? Okay. Um, I, I, I think I wish you well. Uh, it's a great opportunity that you are out here. Um, my advice is uh, do not waste that opportunity. Uh, continue to use it as a learning platform. One of the things we don't do so well in Africa is learning and reading. It says if you want to hide money from an African, you put it in a book. I don't think in this book here. If I put a book in any of you here, I expect to find the money. And unfortunately, if you buy my book, I did put money there, <laughs> and I will find you out if you haven't read it. I think it's important that you continue to be... I, I said earlier on, you are now going to be the catalyst of, this, of our generation. You represent I think, 49 countries here. Uh, guys, it doesn't take an entire army to change, transform a nation. It takes an individual. It took Nelson Mandela, it took Gandhi, it took Washington. It takes an individual to transform. You'll be surprised the power of one person, which is most of you sitting here, going back home and saying, you know what, 
there is a different way of doing things. Maybe we just haven't applied our mind. So let's start actually to show that prowess and not to go out there and just blend. You know, you can't change anything if you just blend. But you don't have to go there and form another political party. There are many ways that you can create a transformative impact for your nations. And my encouragement is be that future that you want your children to enjoy. Otherwise, they'll be pointing back at you and says, where were you? And what did you contribute to the welfare of this nation? So go out there and be counted. Thank and you. good luck. Thank you. Doctor, again, what, what, what's your, your message to, to those young leaders, especially ladies? Yeah, well, first of all, I think um, believing in yourself. You know, you're here because people saw that you had something special. They offered you this opportunity. Um, so you have something to give back to the world, to your country, to the world. You are leaders. And I think believing in yourself and knowing that you um, have the ability to, to create change is incredible. And take that power and use it. And I think, um, as Mr. Moyle said, you know, an individual can make a huge difference. But it's also individuals connected to other individuals. And that's why I, you know, I continue to believe in the power of networks, the power of people coming together. So take your passion, take your knowledge, take all the skills that you have, believe in yourself, and then continue to find ways to come together with others who you know, have the same kind of passion um, to really make change happen and believe that change can happen. Because I think that's the other thing. Sometimes we get tired and don't believe that, that we can make a difference. But change does occur. And if I think about uh, when I first came to Africa back a long time ago, before most of you were born in the, you know, the mid-70s, the difference that I have seen between then and today is you know, tremendous. And that difference is only happening quicker and quicker and quicker. And it's because of the power that, that people have to make change happen. So believe in yourself and believe that change is possible. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, here ends our panel discussion. If you enjoyed it, please put your hands together for our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Twenty seventeen Mandela Washington Fellows. I hope you're all doing well today. My name is Njava Mutambo, and I am from Zambia. And I was at and I was at Skyline College. I'd like to introduce the next guest, but before I introduce him, I'd like to say a personal story. The man that I'm about to introduce to you today helped me tremendously. As many of us young entrepreneurs know, setting up a business in Africa is hard. We face capital problems. And secondly, it's hard to get access to mentors. But the man that I'm about to bring on stage helped my company with the first seed capital and helped us get access to quality mentors. So by the way, I run a company called Musanga Logistics and we are the Uber for packages. We are totally transforming the way packages move in Africa. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we started the business, we had nothing. The man that I'm about to bring on stage gave us our first capital, and today we are one of the fastest growing companies in Southern Africa. We are launching in two new markets. So, before I bring him on stage, I'd like to say a little bit something about him. Tony Elumilu. <laughs> He's an economist by training, a serial entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. He is the founder and chairman of Hairs Holding Limited, an African proprietary investment company with interest in power, oil, gas, and financial services. <laughs> he also has interest in hospitality, real estate, 
healthcare, present in 20 African countries. Tony is known for his significant contribution to entrepreneurship in Africa. How many Tony Luma entrepreneurs are in the room? <laughs> he has committed over $100 million in a 10-year program to fund, mentor, and train 10,000 African entrepreneurs. The foundation's mission is inspired by Tony's economic philosophy of Afro-capitalism, which positions the private sector as a key enabler of economic and social creation in Africa. So ladies and gentlemen, I would invite all of you to put your hands together for Tony O. Elumilu. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the U.S. government for making this possible. You know, this is uh, creating a forum like this for those to whom the future of Africa truly belongs to. It's one of the greatest things we can do for us. As students of history, we must also recognize the role President Barack Obama played in creating this. And most importantly, we recognize the Madiva himself. Africa, indeed, is in great need of leaders like Madiva. And that is why it excites me to interact with you all today. 1,000 young Africans that the future truly belongs to, and those who must seize the future to actually help to shape the destiny of our continent. My colleagues prepared some remarks for me today. We are going to have it posted on our website after my little conversation with you here. But I've decided that this should adopt a different pattern. This, to me, is like conversation with my siblings. Conversation. <laughs> conversation with my younger brothers and sisters from the same family. You have been through this program coming to the end. And the academic work has been done the conceptual definitions and understanding of leadership all shared with you. I think what i like to bring today is the practicality of it in the context of our continent, and more importantly, a call to all of you to realize that Africa indeed is in great need of 21st century leaders who help to transform the continent. We're a continent that is hugely endowed with so much. We should actually be a land of plenty. But unfortunately, we have not been able to get it right. And the only reason this is this way is because of the death of leadership across both public and private sectors. So to come here, I like to share the burden that I carry as I walk around, as I travel all over the world, like yourselves, and you see progress. But the progress you see in other parts of the world is a bit lacking in our, on our continent. So when the US government organizes an event like this and select indeed, great Africans like you, we must seize the opportunity. That is what smart people do. When smart people get opportunities, they exploit it fully. And we will not be exploiting this 
if in some years to come, Africa remains the way it has always been. Today, or soon, you're going to graduate, and you're going to become the Mandela Fellows. So I say congratulations to all of you. But more importantly, you carry a huge moral body. What you're going through or going to pass through is not an end. You should see it as a means to an end until you are able to fulfill the aspirations and dreams that the Mandela's name that you're not going to be associated with had for Africa, for South Africa, for Africa, then it can be said that you're not worthy to be called an associate or a fellow of Mandela. We must begin to walk the talk in Africa. We must begin, if you're called an apostle or follower of someone, you should do no less. You should always see the person at the beacon. As a man, you see in the mirror every day and aspire to be better than that person. Mandela lived a life. He realized a purpose earlier on that things apartheid should be corrected. He also realized that for a man to dream is one thing, but dream is nothing if you don't convert it to reality. And so, having defined the purpose, he went about trying to make it possible. And in the process, he encountered, as you all know, a lot of upheavals, challenges, difficulties, but he never gave up. He finally had the opportunity to bring his country together. South Africa got independent and ruled by, by black men. What he fought for, apartheid, was a system that was obnoxious and totally not good for the people. He loved people. He sacrificed his family for people. He sacrificed the active part of his life for his people. And up to the end, he saw how he lived his life. Where a continent where people want to die in office, he got to say, he thought it was time to move on. And so you're going to be called the Mandela Fellows. Africa at a time like this needs you. Africa is going through its own colonization or colonialism. We fought for political emancipation of Africa, or our fathers fought for it. But today, we have poverty. Africa has been colonized by hunger and poverty. And so, if you are called Mandela Fellows, you should go back with an agenda. The leadership occurs at every level. And the while apartheid is gone, there are other forms of oppression, injustice, and in fact, hardship. And the greatest of it all is poverty, manifesting its way, itself in so many other ways. Youth unemployment in Africa is a challenge to all of us. It's a threat to everyone. And at times I wonder if we, or our leaders, and everyone recognize what this means. We must all work hard to put the youth out of the streets. Failure to do that is a doom for all of us. We have natural resources. We also have demographic structure that, if well and nest, can actually confer a competitive advantage on us as a continent in the 21st century but we're not doing all that we need to do. So your generation should be a different generation. It should not be a talk generation. It should not be a generation that does only, knows only how to complain, but unable to change things when opportunity arises. Your generation should not be a passive and docile generation 
we know in Canada, a man under the age of 39, Trudeau, is the prime minister president there. In France, Macron just came up. And so if my generation is wasted and those ahead came before us, your generation should be different. And don't ever use my generation as a yastic for not doing what you should be doing. We must all realize that in the 21st century, no one but us will develop our continent. And if we have failed to play that role, you must do things differently because you're better informed. And the age you're operating is an age of empowerment. Age you have everything to make a difference. So we should stop being totally passive about how we are governed. When we were Growing up, we used to think that politics was for second class people. But we have long realized the stupidity in that line of thought. The basis support the superstructure. And so if you have a weak foundation, the structure will not last. We remain a continent whose destiny is shaped by people we think are called second class citizens. And I say to people, when you go to a country, and I know for a fact a country, where a madman directs the flow of traffic, it tells you that something is fundamentally wrong in that society. It tells you that everyone is beneath the IQ of that madman or the madman will shape everyone to operate in that fashion. And that is what this generation must be intolerant of. Otherwise, you'll not be paying good or reward to the name you're carrying, going to carry from now on, or to the US government that I thought it wise, really wise, because what, I am one of those who say that the age we live in today is not age of don't uh, hand up. Teach people how to become self-reliant and fishermen. And I believe that knowledge is one of the greatest things you can give to mankind. And gathering all of you from 49 African countries in this room, a thousand of you, to train you about the values and principles of leadership is indeed one of the best gifts anyone can give to us as a continent. But it behooves all of us to take advantage of this unique moment and opportunity. And so as we go back to our respective places, you must make certain resolutions. First, you should tell yourself that this is just the beginning. This is a call to action. Being called a Mandela Fellow is a call to action and that you will fulfill that action. Two, you must tell yourself that leadership is not just about presidents, political leaders, and that leadership occurs at every level. There's so much that every one of us can do at a time like this, and you must play your own part in making this happen. I'm told that in the garden we have entrepreneurs, we have people in the public sector, uh, NGO or civil society, etc. I was discussing with some of my colleagues last week, and I said, society that lacks pressure groups cannot survive. And that is what I see in most African countries. We must hold ourselves totally accountable. We must ask for good leadership, public and private sector. It's the minimum, absolute minimum, that Africa needs at a time like this. Thirdly, you must tell yourself that this is not a complaining or complaint generation. This is a doing generation.
we talk too much and we complain too much. And most of the time when we even get the opportunity, we hardly make any meaningful changes. You must realize, you must realize that there's no time in history than now that you have a unique moment and opportunity to assert and assume leadership. And you must realize that leadership to a large extent is not bestowed. It's not handed over to you. You must prepare yourself for leadership and be able to accept it. There's vacuum, leadership vacuum in Africa. In the public sector, there is. In the private sector, there is. And that leader can be you and should, in fact, be yourselves. So I end by saying we should realize that we have had struggles for political independence, but we have come to realize equally important, or if not even more important, economic empowerment, job opportunities for our young ones, economic, economic prosperity for everyone, inclusive growth that recognizes all strata everyone, bringing our women folk into the activities affairs of state and the economy. <laughs> are things we must do. Finally, if there's one thing you must not forget from today's conversation, it's what I'm about to talk about. It's legacy. It is legacy. I have tried to study mankind. I've tried to study leaders, both political and business leaders, because I try to be a good leader. It's a journey. So at times you do well, at times you fumble. And I've tried to see those leaders that I respect. Why are they, why were they successful? And hindsight, as they say, is the biggest teacher. Would I look at the history and lives of this world, their writings, their doctrines, philosophies, what they shared, etc.? I see a common thread and I did tread of legacy. When you start with the end in view, you do well. So as young leaders to whom the future of our continent truly belongs, and who must struggle to actually assume that leadership, just the way our parents struggled for political independence, you must think legacy. You must think long term. You must ask yourself, how would I like to be remembered? Because it is in finding answer to those questions that true meaning of our existence as human beings is explained. When my family and I decided to launch the Tony Melu Foundation and endow the foundation with the sum of 100 million US dollars to train, capacitize, and empower. 10,000 Africans, we didn't do it because we were the richest. And we didn't do it because we had so much. We struggled to make this happen. But it's all about definition, understanding, and reconciling ourselves to how we want to be remembered long after we're gone. Because what does it profit anyone to keep all your resources in the bank accounts? You don't even know how your kids are going to spend the money if you do not share part of it to bring economic prosperity to everyone. Realizing that poverty anyway is a threat to my kind of women. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you go back, one word, legacy. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 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 So I think uh, it's time for question and answers, and I'm happy to take uh, comments from, from you all. So if we call our names, organization we represent, feel free, no host bad, ask any question, and let's hope that at the end of the day we'll come up with an agenda that will help our continent. Yes, you. Thank you so much. My name is Julius Mtatiro. My track was uh, is public management from Syracuse University, and I'm a Tanzanian. Um, my question is simply on leadership, because you have talked a little bit about leadership. And I would just quickly uh, grasp, grasp the example of Nelson Mandela and Julius Nyerere. Julius Nyerere was the most loved president of Tanzania, and then he decided to leave the office and let others uh, lead Tanzania. And again, Nelson Mandela did the same. After f uh, fighting the upper side, and then South Africa uh, got its, its independence, then Mandela, uh, while he was still the most loved person in South Africa, he decided to quit the office. And now I would just want you to, 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 to make commentary on the current African situation when we have kind of leaders, and you have talked about legacy. I don't know if they, they continue to, to, to put legacy on Africa or something is going on wrong. So I would like you to, to, to put a commentary on that one. In relation to what President Obama has urged Africans a few years ago, that actually Africa needs strong institutions. It is, that does not need a strong people. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think it's a simple, you actually have addressed it. You know, it's a legacy is a solution. If people realize that they would never be in one place forever, and that whatever you are today, others who come in behind you will even surpass it. And also they think of how, what history will say about them. Then they will think, do things different. However, what I said to this gathering, South Africa did not get independence on a platter of gold. You know, and this is why I say this generation should be a different type of generation. We need to demand what is good for us. We are ruled by people who have biologically, how many more years to live? And they are going to leave challenges for you. You know, average biological age, let's say 70 or 80, you have, by God's grace, say 50 more years to live. And we are being doomed and, you know, misled by people who have less than 10 more years on earth. So it's a, it's a, it, it calls to question a lot. And this generation does not even know the level of power that you have. We live in a digital age where most, in fact, in Africa in particular, those who are under the age of 30, we are told, constitute 60% of our population. So there's power to effect changes, positive changes, or just that it takes time for people to realize the power that they have. And the old politicians are manipulating and exploiting the weakest weakness. And so if you're Mandela fellows, you must always remember what Mandela stood for. And in the context of what we are suffering today, he, his era was era of political apartheid. Today's era, in fact, it's arguable. People can tell you, I don't even care how I'm going, if there's an apartheid or not, so long I can eat my three square meals and send children to school. 
Today, it's getting difficult for some people to have three square meals and send children to school. We must therefore find true essence of who we are and who we want to be in the 21st century by asking deep questions to ourselves. Okay, yes, please. You, yes. Thank you so much. I'm called Simon Marotulong. I'm from South Sudan. And uh, I've been placed at Arizona State University for the last six weeks. Uh, my question is, as you stated, Glenn, that uh, we need leaders for the 21st century. And you said that there was a time when you really realized that politics was part of our life. So my question is, to the African leaders that are already there, apart from grooming the next uh, upcoming future leaders of Africa and the next entrepreneurs, what is your role and what is the role of Tony Emelu Foundation in changing the political trend in Africa right now? <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, setting up the foundation is about e economically empowering our young ones. And I would be happy one day to see a Tony Emelu entrepreneur becoming president of a country. <laughs> and it will happen. Yeah. Also, also play advocacy role. Because we realize that for entrepreneurs to succeed, the operating environment must be right. And we engage with government to help shape policies. Some government will capacitize them, will provide fellows to support them, especially in their economic uh, management uh, area. So I would say changing Africa is a collective responsibility of all of us. Every one of us must first identify and real agree that we need Africa to see an improved Africa in the 21st century. Because the truth is, the world is moving, and new leadership is evolving in other parts of the world. And we might face a huge risk a huge risk of Africa even retarding further instead of making progress, even remaining where we are today. And so, Tony Elumelu Foundation, Tony Elumelu yourself and yourselves, friends of Africa and other Africans must realize that we need a new kind of leadership, public sector, private sector, to move Africa forward. So it's a collective responsibility. Our lady. My name is Splenda from Kenya. I was at Appalachian State University for civic leadership. And uh, you're all about economic empowerment in Africa. But we have so many challenges that affect that environment. And one of the challenges are these external factors that involve other governments uh, which make decisions based on fair foreign interests. And most of the time, you'll find our leaders in a position whereby they are global economic puppets, whereby, yes, we want to be economically empowered, but we will set our own environment in our countries to be right. But when you, when you want to now uh, go beyond our borders, we can only go so far based on all these other factors because it's like a global economic war and there's so many other things controlling us. And looking at other countries like China's, China and the trends they have taken, what is your take on that? And how can we as leaders, uh, when we get to such a position, how can we be able to maneuver and conquer such things? Okay, I have a slightly different perspective on this. First is, uh, in the 21st century, we need massive investment into Africa. And investment should not have any coloration. We should encourage Africans to invest in Africa. We should encourage Chinese to invest in Africa. We should encourage Americans to invest in Africa. We encourage Japanese, Middle uh, Easterners, anywhere because it is through the inflow of investment to the continent or the internal generation of uh, creation of investment that will ultimately help us to create the jobs we need as a continent. And that is encapsulated in the philosophy of African capitalism. 
you know, private sector getting involved in by investing in key sectors that will help create economic prospect, uh, prosperity as well as uh, social wealth. So we need both. And we need to begin to change our mentality also as a people. In the 21st century, what I think, we should be engaging in a different fashion. And that's also why I talk about leadership. If we have the right leadership, our leaders would engage in a manner that creates uh, opportunities for their people. It is a lack of opportunities and which also is driven by myopia of leadership and emptiness of leadership that creates the kind of problem that, that, that we see. Sorry, I'll come back to this side. Let, let me not be accused of uh, left hand. Okay. Um, yes, the man in white in front. Then I'll go to the back. Yes, I'm coming to you. You are next. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, sir. My name is Usman Alilawan and I'm from Nigeria. Wow. Uh, I'm a Tony Alumele entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, and uh, on behalf of myself and uh, over 20 of us here, oh, wow. I want to say a big thank you to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank I you. was placed at the Oklahoma State University. But I have always wanted to ask you this. Yes. And thankfully, now I have an opportunity. <laughs> Go ahead. I remember when you moved from Standard Trust Bank to UBA, um, everybody went like, look, you don't turn an elephant around. He's probably not going to be able to do it. But we all saw you did it. We knew what happened between 2009 and 2010 towards 2011, and we saw UBA flew through. I want to ask you, sir, <laughs> how did you do it? <laughs> Thank you, Lao. <laughs> Thank you very Secondly, much. Secondly, sir, oh, okay. I want to know, sorry, what inspired you to start the Tony Alumelu Foundation? Um, and also, what happens after the 10 years? Okay. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. So the first uh, question, I think, um, First is Laura, thanks so much, and uh, I'm uh, impressed that you have uh, your national uh, costume. Uh, even in green and white, the national colors. So the, I think I'll just share a few nuggets of um, what helped us to, to, so by the way, for the audience, what he's talking about in our early day, entrepreneurship journey. In the early days, we acquired a distressed bank. We turned around that distressed bank, and after some years, we, we merged, acquired and merged with the third largest bank in the country. Then we had about 120 banks. And the distressed bank that was turned around and now moved on to, to acquire and merge with the third largest bank uh, created a huge financial services group in Nigeria and today operates in 20, 19 African countries, operates in Paris. <laughs> operates in London and is the only African bank that is regulated in the United States of America. We operate here in New York. <laughs> so I would say that the Reason is first our people. And I say, the, and you know, you all are what human staff are to organization, what you are to the continent of Africa. And that's why my speech is, to a large extent, all about you. That, you know, if you are leaders, should be encouraging you all. Because leaders who are there today will not be there forever. Mandela was there, he's no longer there, others will come. So great leaders have pipeline of successors, strong succession, so that when they leave, others will come in, because it is inevitable anyway. So we assembled the right team, we shared their aspirations, they bought into it, they owned it, they became passionate about it, and they drove it. And we just asked ourselves, we have to have three tier strategic intent, Tier one was to take the distressed bank and turn it around so that once the distressed bank can become viable and we give ourselves a time frame. So as leaders, both private and public sector leaders, 
it's always good to have a purpose, a vision, and to create milestones and put time frame to it. Because I would like you to develop long-term aspirations and to think long-term in accomplishing those aspirations. Because it is in the long term that I actually create a meaningful impact. But at the same time, if you don't create huge milestones and make some wins, at times, because you're human, you might get discouraged. So that's one of the reasons it's good to have such of milestones. So we created milestones and went about it. The second tier intent was to say, okay, I want to become one of the top 10 banks in the country. And again, we worked out and we accomplished that. The third year intent was to become one of the top three banks in the country. And we accomplished that. So I would say that significantly have getting the right people, thinking strategically what you want to achieve, creating milestones, working very hard, being resilient, because it's the journey is not always linear. It goes <laughs> up and down, you know. So all of this helped us to accomplish what we accomplished. And there's someone in the audience here who was key part of the turnaround team at Sanda Trust Bank. Uh, Chika Mode, are you there? Stand up and be recognized as one of those who made it happen. <laughs> okay, the second question. Second, the second question, what, happened, what motivated uh, what created the motivation for this foundation? I think, as I said before, you know, growing up, I am a typical African boy, born and bred in Africa, schooled in Africa. Everything was Africa, and then worked or works in Africa and attain some level of, uh, of uh, shall I say, economic empowerment? <laughs> economic what? Authority. <laughs> Prosperity, okay. A level of uh, comfort, okay. <clears throat> and after a while, when I retired from this running United Bank of Africa as CEO, I asked myself, what next? And, and again, it's about legacy. You know, seeing poverty around, um, looking at my own life story, you know, from a regular to Nelumelu <laughs> to, to where one is today, and asking myself how I can institutionalize luck. Because we all are products of so many factors. The kind of place you work or worked in, the kind of leaders you had, your upbringing, so many environmental issues, even the time you operated. So I don't feel that it would be nice for young Africans who have ideas, but are limited by capital. It would be nice to give them support. Because there are so many, when I interact with our young ones, they have ideas, they can even, Indeed, Africa must create its jobs, and it has to happen. But when people have great ideas, and it's, when you have crossed like the level you are now, it might, it's easier for banks to give even loans to start. But that's just concept stage. It's almost impossible. So I felt it would be nice to support people. And next thing was, should it be a Nigerian type foundation? focus or support people only in Nigeria or across Africa. I realized, you know, I think it was Disraeli that said this thing about poverty and you have been poor, I tried to make an everywhere. And also, it, born in Nigeria, but more of an African citizen. And there's a need to let this spread. And in hope that at the end of the day, it's not even what we do as a foundation alone, but what how other is able to catalyze other actions. And that is why today we talk to other agencies and say, we have many people applying. Last year, we had 95,000 people apply for 1,000 spaces. And we're saying, take some and also have them. 
We want to see this as a movement on the corner. We want others to take from these entrepreneurs, brand them the way they like, and let's train them. Let's realize that truly the future of our corner belongs to people like this. And now what do we do 10 years, in 10 years' time? Well, seven years. <laughs> so basically, the foundation is about empowering young Africans, and this is one of the flagship activities of the foundation. So when we close this, we would either do another one or engage in other things. But it's all about creating economic prosperity for our continent. Anything we need to do to make that happen, and once we have the resources, we would not fail to deploy it. Thank you. OK, sorry, yes, so I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Yes, you, please. We still have uh, seven and a half minutes, so we we'll have. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Dashan Farad. I'm a reporter for yourblackworld.net uh, here in the United States. Uh, sir, you mentioned uh, during your lecture Nelson Mandela and Julius Nyeri. What I would like to know, uh, you mentioning these two uh, figures who placed the emphasis on uh, unifying the continent, do you feel that the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi was at all justified in your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think it's a, it's a tough question, and I'm sure my colleagues will be cringing. They, they'll be cringing that I should not say something. But I want to say something. I want to say something to that question. You know, nature abhors vacuum. And Africa must begin to take its destiny in its hands. We must begin to direct the nature and complex complexion of conversations with Africa and about Africa. We must be concerned about the narrative on Africa. We must be able to tell our stories ourselves. We must let those we relate with know things that are important to us as a people. We must not allow for our agenda to be set by others. You know, leadership is not alien to Africa. In fact, when my late grandparents talked to me about Africa, and as you see in the traditional African setup today, the leadership is firmly rooted in our history and origin as a people. And the way we define leadership, you know, when you go to China, there's a way they define leadership. In the West, there's a way. We must not allow one form of leadership determine and define the rest of the world. People have argued, and I'm in that camp, that some people, the absence of some people have created regional imbal security imbalance. We also have seen situation where people have repented, turned new leaf, and have been embraced to become better leaders. So at some point, I'm sure the world will debate some of these issues. And political students and actors who play their role in some of this will be in a position to comment further. So I'll say no more on this. Sorry. So I, sorry, I promised this lady. Yes, you. Yes. Five minutes, okay. Five minutes. <laughs> so please make the question so that we can take two more, please, fast. Okay. My name is Uche Naubu. I'm from Nigeria. I've been at the Northwestern University, Illinois. Um, I've thought about this question even before I knew I'm going to say it today. <laughs> so the, the question is this. We are so much in Africa, and you have one Tony Elumelu Foundation and we have influential, rich people in Africa. 
So, what do we do to get people interested in thinking about being rich as influencing young Africans, not about the number of cars you have or private jets? <laughs> okay, I think, uh, thanks. I believe that I'm a strong believer in prosperity and I'm also a strong believer in the fact that we should not criminalize wealth. But it becomes an issue if your wealth is self-centered. And that is why the kind of growth and development we want in Africa is inclusive one. We want mutual prosperity. We don't want barbed economy. We don't want a society where some have, some don't have. And I think it's all again encapsulated or defined in this philosophy of legacy. If, and I think <laughs> it is deficit of the mind that makes a man think that you keep accumulating forever and keep in account. You can accumulate as a hobby, etc., but you must also find how to share what you accumulate. Because the truth is, I share to I tell my colleagues this. When I was in university, some point it was difficult to eat three square meals as a student. For those of you Nigerian students will know the one zero one zero one or zero one one. Do you know it? <laughs> so I too, I, I, I had that challenge. And I resolved that when I have money, I'll eat this very well. Today, if you eat one bagel, you're counting the calories. <laughs> so how much can you even eat? And I honestly, our children, good education, good moral values and they can conquer the world. So I think that all of us, we should, social media engagement, writing, in a manner that is constructive. And we are doing that. And I think I've seen even what we are doing, how it's catalyzing others, how it's, it's making others also think to do something like this. Because, and it happens, the history of even America where philanthropy is significantly advanced. It took the passing, I think, of J.P. Morgan for Vanderbilt, for, for, for Vanderbilt, for others to, to just, um, Rockefeller and Co. In fact, Ford, Ford, Vanderbilt, Paul, to now wake up and say, we need to do things differently. So it's a journey. It has begun. And we would hope that everyone will catch up. The key thing is legacy. How do I want to remember? What is it? It's not the money your bank account I will remember. It's the impact that you created I will remember. Okay, two more. Ah! One, 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 one. Okay, you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, lady, like give me two minutes. One, one, 30 seconds. And you, you, lady, sign. Okay, come to the front. 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Be fast. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Stella uh, from Zambia. And my question is, you know, I'm one of the people that applied for the tip and I didn't get it. So uh, a lot of us get rejection and I'm sure you've gotten rejection. So I just want uh, advice on what we can do to not be discouraged and just stop because rejection keeps coming. I know, don't worry. The fact that you were not selected does not mean you're not great. Entrepreneurs don't give up. They are resilient, so don't give up, please. Don't give up. Well, yes. 30 seconds, please, please, please. Where are the two of you? Okay, give, give her first. Give her and this is the last. I am so sorry. But you know what? Engage me on social media, my Twitter handle, my Facebook, and I will respond to you all. In fact, I will respond. Yes, quickly. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Eva I'm from Nigeria. I went to Skyline College Business and Entrepreneurship Track. So my question is, observably, we've noticed that a lot of leaders don't leave government position because they don't really have where to go after that. So can you prescribe like a career path for people who enter <laughs> politics and what they can do after, so that they can leave, so that we can go in? 
practical. I will comment. I will take the last and I will comment. That is a very practical question, by the way. Very, very real. That is it. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the last. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you for this opportunity, sir. My name is Mr. Rashito. I'm a carpenter from Nigeria. I, I was one of the Tony Melu um, Howardy. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. The uh, grant I got from you, I used it to buy um, one of my machinery that I use for Deputy Governor's project that won me Africa's Best Interior Designer. Wow. I really thank you for that opportunity. I'm so grateful. Then secondly, um, my business is capital intensive and $5,000 wasn't enough for me. Sure. So I want to ask you, I don't have a collateral to get <laughs> funds for this um, machinery. <clears throat> what can you do to help businesses like us to, to scale up our businesses. Then secondly, I will tell you. Thirdly, okay, sir. If my books are right, sir, will you be willing to invest in my business? Thank okay, you. Okay. You know, so uh, let me start with the last lady because we're running up now. Entrepreneurs know how to seize moments. So this lady, she has seen now is like an opportunity to take advantage of it. I can't stand here and tell whether we invest or not. But S O D S are platform companies, a proprietary African investment company. We invest in key sectors of the African economy, financial services, real estate, hospitality, etc. If you engage with us, you know, you go to SOD, you see about us investments that you send note, or you're even part of the family, since you're an alumni, just send information, they'll look at it, if it makes sense, they'll come back to you or not. That's number, and the chief investor officer is here with me. Number two, the second point you raise about uh, the more cap capital, more collateral, I think it's a commercial banking discussion. And, but for the foundation where Bumi is here, we're trying to raise money to the, do a Pan-African fund that will help, because we wanted to do 5,000, but we realized the sacrifice is nothing for those who are actually successful like you and others. So we're trying to put into a fund and get others to invest in the fund so that we can have something more sizable. That also could be a sort. And the first one, congratulations for your success. And uh, that's what I like. What you owe me is to succeed and help create more jobs. That's what I want in all of this you're doing. Thank you. And to our lady there, your question is apt. You know, who he who must seek equity must also seek equity with clean hands. We expect so much of our leaders, and at times we pay lip service to certain issues. You know, and people complain the leaders are paid this. And I say, it's not even what they are paid that is important, it's what they state that is important, or the kind of wrong decision they make because of pecuniary motivation that is an issue. I totally support paying our leaders well. You know, they are basic human needs. Those who don't have the basic human needs, nature have all you. If you like, deceive yourself. They will find out how to get it. Let's support them so that we can hold them firmly accountable for uh, property. And the last point about what people are doing after they leave of it is true. However, you know, I had a meeting in New York yesterday, two days ago and yesterday, and at the meeting I had, People were telling me how they, they are hiring the chief officer to this person who was a secretary in America, how they are hiring different people who went off. In fact, here, people live as ministers or secretaries. Others are begging them to come and work for them. When, so I'm telling myself, you know, if we had this in Africa, it would address, in fact, just to this guy thinking about it, to address the point you raised. But the reason we don't have it is that when people are in offices, they don't think legacy. They don't distinguish themselves. I can only, as a private sector person, take on someone who has distinguished himself or herself whilst in public service. We need to do something about that, and the conversation must start. It should start from here, but more importantly, those public sector leaders should realize that there is life after office, should do things with legacy in mind, so that when you want to engage, you say, this person, these are his views on issues. It's compatible with what we need. Let's approach the person. As we, you know, people should leave government offices and then say, 
they are okay. And that actually can help address the grid that we see in leadership. So ladies and gentlemen, so nice being with you today. Appreciation to US government, to the organizers of Yali, the lady who is handling it, organizers of Yali, the Mandela uh, Wanji Fellows, and most importantly, to yourselves. Congratulations, <laughs> but you must realize that Africa needs you, especially at a time like this. And I know one but us to develop our continent, and that this must not be a complaint generation, that this must be a generation of action that will help to take Africa out of where it is today. And most importantly, you must think, breathe, and remember and act legacy. Thank you very much.